This is the day that the Lord hath made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. I am so thankful to have this opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Please bow with me in believing prayer. God of grace and God of glory, we do praise and magnify your name. Lord, I thank you for yet another opportunity to stand before your presence, to preach your word to your people. I pray now, Father, that you would not allow me to speak as a mere man, but rather as an oracle of Christ. Use these lips of clay to speak a word of hope to the sinner, to speak a word of healing to the sick, and to speak a word of help to the saints. Oh God, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me anew and anoint me afresh. Hide me behind your cross so that you and you alone might be glorified. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, it's in the powerful and perfect name of Jesus that we pray. Thank God. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. I am reading from the English Standard Version. And here's how my Bible reads. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Once again, in your hearing for emphasis, verse number 22 says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? For the moments that are ours to share, I want to put a tag on this text, and I simply want to talk from this thought, yes, there is a cure. Yes, there is a cure. I have come to share good news. I believe that in the face of our looming crisis, that's exactly what we all need. Unfortunately, in order for us to enjoy the full measure of this good news, we must first get a clear overview of the bad news. What do you mean, preacher? Well, COVID-19 is not history's first pandemic, and it definitely isn't the most severe. You can Google the word and get a list of previous diseases, timetables, and death tolls. But as I researched this pandemic issue, I noticed that humankind's deadliest and most widespread sickness didn't make the list. The disease which I am now referring to is sin. Guess what? No test is needed. No doctor should be consulted. No clinic has to be visited. You are right now infected with it. And if you've reproduced, you've already given it to someone else. 
Scripture has published these results. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So friends, if you're keeping score, here is the breakdown. Everyone has this disease. Everyone manifests the symptoms. Everyone will potentially die from it. Only God has the cure. These timeless truths are not only relevant right now, but they are the real implications of what the prophet Jeremiah said to Judah in his day. This troubled man was a courageous and persistent mouthpiece for God over the course of some 40 years. His difficult life and ministry began before Israel's Babylonian captivity and continued into it. God called him to warn the people of what was to come, but they still didn't listen. The people's Sin of choice was idolatry, and God was fed up. So he sends Jeremiah to stand in the temple gate to proclaim the reason for their coming calamities. The lament, which I've read into your hearing, is a disturbing portion of the larger section of his temple rebuke that runs from chapter 7, verse 1, all the way to chapter 10, verse 25. People, both then and now, need to know that their sins don't go unnoticed and that God offers both opportunity for change and indictment on those who don't. Our sickness is real. It doesn't discriminate, and we cannot heal ourselves. That's the bad news. But the good news, even now, is that God is both monitoring and medicating our condition, and he will provide relief if we will simply bring our spiritual sickness to him. Our text today records Jeremiah's painful lament in the middle of his prophetic preaching. And through it, we discover that God alone is the cure for the sinfulness that truly afflicts us. Let me rewind that and press play and say it again. God alone is the cure for the sinfulness that truly afflicts us afflicts us. The question on the table that I want to ask and answer in our time together is simply this. How does this prophecy teach us that God is our only cure? Notice, first of all, it begins in verse 18 by sharing with us the prophet's emotional sorrow. The prophet can't find personal relief because he's grieving for the people that he serves. Jeremiah is the poster child for ministerial dysfunction. More than any other prophet, major or minor, he has partnered with the people he spoke to in their sorrow. While he is clear about what God has said and why God is disciplining Judah, He has still become sympathetic to their punishment to the point of personal anguish. So here in verse 18, chapter 8, he begins this personal lament with a testimony of his own feelings. By his own witness, he is joyless, grief-stricken, and lovesick over what's to come for God's people. This sinful and rebellious people are the focus of a confused, depressed, and troubled prophet. Here we see a powerful image of what it really means to join people in their pain. Whether they deserve it or not, 
whether God is, is the disciplinarian or not, we must follow Jeremiah's example of authentic sympathy, which leads him to openly disclose his misery over hurting people. Domestic discipline provides us with the perfect picture of Jeremiah's feelings. He was much like the mother of some children with behavioral challenges. She warns them that their father will not tolerate their misbehavior, but when he begins to discipline these children, the mother can't bear to watch. So she turns away and cringes at the sight and sound of her children's corrections. Let's be honest, even now, and admit this hurts. It hurts to watch others sick and dying. It hurts to see people victimized by illness. It hurts to have the doors locked on our physical interactions and still have to manage the ever-increasing emotions. It hurts to be faced with racial injustice. It hurts to know that your vote just may not count. It hurts to be living in a country where someone so ungodly is sitting in the Oval Office. It hurts to be in this world in a season like this. But I need to tell you that when the pain is this deep, only God can treat it. Not only does the prophet express his emotional sorrow in verse 18, but then in verses 19 through 20, the prophet speaks to us about conflicting separation. The people can accept that God isn't acting because of their unfaithfulness, so they accuse God of being absent. Please remember that Jeremiah is a priest by pedigree and a prophet by calling. This means that as a priest, he was tasked to speak to God in behalf of the people. However, as a prophet, he was assigned to speak to the people in behalf of God. This text finds him in a tug of war between living as a prophet and being born as a priest. Here, this pain-filled poet gives voice to both the accusations of the people and the anger of God himself. He opens with the cry of the daughter of his people, which can be heard across the land. They will wonder when judgment comes, where is God? The question of the Lord's presence would be a great concern when these prophecies came true. They would inevitably feel abandoned by the God that they had run away from themselves. Listen as God responds through Jeremiah to their questions with his own. Why have they provoked me by choosing idols over me? This nation has promised, had promised during its liberation from bondage in Egypt to express covenantal loyalty to Jehovah. According to Exodus 20 and 3, they had promised to have no other gods. But unfortunately, that's exactly what they had done. They picked false gods over the real God. They chose to worship what was made instead of who made them. They decided to depend on dead things they could see instead of trusting in the living God that they couldn't see. Now the people speak up again with this sense of prevailing hopelessness. They say that the time for harvest has come and gone and we have nothing to show for it. In other words... God has allowed the seasons to change right in front of us and still failed to show up 
and provide for us. Present in this tragic text is God's truth and the people's misunderstanding. They will accuse God of the true crime which their sins had forced them to commit. This sad song about a sin-sick people separated from God is an eerie picture of our present situation. Even now, we are filled with questions of God's presence and God's concern. But please be clear, it's not God that has abandoned us. We, because of our love affair with sin, have broken up with him. And I need to tell you that when the breach is this wide, only God can fill it. Not only is there emotional sorrow here presented by the prophet, not only is there conflicting separation, but note finally, there is, according to verses 21 and 22, national sickness. They need a remedy, but nothing and no one is available because they've rejected God. The prophet finalizes this section with a bookend of his own burdens. He makes another statement of his sorrow. He raises two rhetorical questions to expose the people's unfortunate condition and then offers a final inquiry. Jeremiah tells us that his heart is hurting because of the wound of the daughter of his people. This verse is really an advanced restatement of his somber mood in verse 18. He is wounded, he is mourning, and he is overwhelmed. Then he inserts this powerful picture. With his questions, he likens Judah to a patient with open wounds for whom there is no relief. Gilead was a city east of the Jordan with a unique tree that was used to manufacture a healing ointment. This picture would resonate with his audience and his point would come into focus. He's really asking, since healing is available, why are you still sick? The people needed God, but repentance was necessary. And the right physician had to be consulted. However, instead of returning to God and listening to a true prophet, they opted to stay sick. They drifted toward idols and listened to false prophets with insufficient remedies. Hear me now. Open wounds, bad prescriptions, Unlicensed doctors was the sad state of Israel's situation. And even worse, this is many of our states as well. When the sickness is this severe, only God can heal it. There is this tragic sense of rejection in Jesus in Jeremiah's day. Please understand that sin is erosive. It is not an illness that shows up and settles down. No friends left untreated. Sin will eat you alive from the inside out. Look at the progression of this lament. First, there is the cry of the daughter of my people. Then there are the wounds of the daughter of my people. But when we arrive at chapter 9, verse 1, now Jeremiah is weeping over the slain of the daughter of my people. Here we see this prophet who is a priest weeping over the plight of his people who have rejected God. Not only was God rejected in Jeremiah's day, 
But when we check the record of Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, we find out that God was rejected in Jesus' day. The text says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus also weeps over Jerusalem, knowing that they had rejected the things that produce peace and missed the day of God's visitation. But this Jesus, who wept as Jeremiah did, was prophet, priest, and propitiation. In Christ, we discover that the medicine and the doctor are one in the same. Yes, there is a cure. Yes, he is our spiritual balm in Gilead. Yes, he is our great physician. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So long, brothers and sisters. May the Lord bless you real good. But I'm glad to report and tell you, yes, there is a cure. I've got a story to tell you about some things that I've been through. I've had some ups and some downs. I've been leveled to the ground, but I'm healed. Yes, I'm healed. I had to wrestle all night long, wondering what went wrong. But I'm healed, yes I'm healed, had some sunshine and some rain, some heartache and some pain, but I'm healed, yes I'm healed. My God has touched me, delivered me, set my soul free. My heart is mended, I'm whole again. No chains are holding me, got my liberty. I'm healed, I'm healed. With his stripes, I am healed. Is there anybody on the line that's glad that Jesus, he is the cure? Yes, I was born sick, but one day I was born again. He healed me. He delivered me, yes, he set me free, and I'm glad to report that I got a doctor that can fix it. I got a doctor that can treat it, yes. 